<clears throat> Hello, and welcome to week two of recruitment, selection, and placement. So, we do have a bit to tackle this week. So, um, I'll, get, I'll kind of review the objectives and outcomes for the week, and then we'll uh, tackle the assignment that's due at the end of week two. So, as far as understanding the social and legal obligations for an employment relationship, as you learn in Introduction to Human Resources, there are certain laws we need to follow in regards to hiring the right person for the job to make sure we're not violating any laws to discriminate against persons, uh, as they would say, protected persons. But the term protected person could be so broad uh, that, it's, you know, again, the idea here is that we hire the most qualified first person for the position and that we follow the affirmative action EEOC laws in regards to providing that equal opportunity. So as far as the social foundations, I guess the best way I'm going to uh, say this, this is not necessarily a matter of law. Sometimes the social foundations can relate to law. Sometimes they cannot. And this could be a variety of different things, such as uh, the work environment you foster. It's not illegal to be negative. As a manager, it's not illegal to be a jerk, as they say in HR a lot. So, you know, in other words, if someone runs and complains to the manager that their boss is mean, well, it's not illegal to be mean. So, um, and that's kind of a phrase that HR professionals use. It, professionals use. It's not illegal to be a jerk, although they don't particularly like it when people are. So that's basically about it. So in regards to diversity and inclusion, again, I'm going to just reference to this as equal opportunity and maintaining a diverse workforce. And diversity does not necessarily have to do with gender or race. It can. But what about diversity in thinking? Differences in thinking. We might all think differently based on our life experiences. So... The culture I grew up in, for instance, is much different than the culture someone may have grew up here, you know, in central Pennsylvania or Perry County versus Cumberland County, for instance. It could be some difference in York County. So, again, if you look at the nature of human beings, the idea here is that we all have different ways of thinking. If you look at it from an international perspective, it's definitely the case. When you look at marketing to different countries, their social norms, the way they look at the world, the way they behave day to day is radically different than what we do in the United States of America. But even in the United States of America, I, I always said Delaware is one of the silliest places ever. North Delaware and Southern Delaware are completely different places, by far completely different places. And uh, you have to adapt to the cultures there. So I think diversity in that respect, and hiring diversely and maintaining a diverse workforce creates a competitive advantage for that organization. So they know how to expand their product or service to multiple consumer bases rather than a few. So how do you evaluate workforce diversity, especially when it comes to recruitment selection and the like here? Um, you have to make sure that you're advertising in a way where, you know, it's just common for people to access that the jobs are available. Life has gotten a lot easier with the birth of the internet. Does anyone go and log in and, you know, log, log in on the internet, go ahead, search your company. You can go ahead and post something on Indeed. It's out there. It's out there all the time. That Ferris wheel keeps going 24 seven. I stole that from Matthew McConaughey, I think, but that's okay. But the idea here is that basically, um, you know, there's a lot more with technology. Um, back before the internet, and, and yes, there was a time there was no internet, and I had to ride a dinosaur to get to the payphone and all. Uh, basically, they would do newspapers, but like, say, for instance, and I'm just going to pick on Delaware. It's easier. So they have three counties, Newcastle, Kent, and Sussex. So if you're offering a state position, and it's it's statewide, say, or like the state police or uh, state government agency, 
as an example, or maybe even for the private sector, you want to make sure to go ahead and um, provide those job postings in all three counties. Make sure that you hit the larger cities like Wilmington or Dover so that you've said you've advertised diversely. In other words, you've had other, you know, you've had enough of an advertisement where individuals know that the job exists and that they can apply for it. And that's part of the equal opportunity. Um, I think it was, yeah, the Delaware State Police made a mistake years ago, and it, it was disparate impact, not disparate treatment. For some of you that were in my HR class, you were probably familiar with this example where they didn't mean to, but they weren't advertising widely enough, and they can fix that. That's no problem. They can do that. Now, one of the issues that comes up is what if the applicants who are applying for a job are not diverse? Well, you cannot help who applies or doesn't apply for a position. It's a matter of um, making sure that you're doing your job in HR to recruit from a diverse population and individuals can apply to jobs that they want. Um, we have no control over that. And I always said that I'm teaching HR for years that there's nothing we can do about that except to continue putting out postings and making sure we're diverse. So what happens here, folks, is basically there's sometimes trends where certain persons will apply for certain jobs. So even starting my first career as a juvenile probation officer, they, especially in one unit, they had zero men. Why? More women than men apply for juvenile probation and also major in social work. Although you can, I was a criminal justice major, although you can major in criminal justice to be a juvenile probation officer. More men than women, at least at the time, applied for adult probation and parole. They were mostly criminal justice. The strange part about that, too, was the test for adult probation and parole was more on criminal justice, whereas the test for the uh, juvenile probation was more based on social work. More women than men major in social work like fields and more men than women major in criminal you know, justice. So the tests for men were higher for adult and lower for juvenile because they didn't really teach me how casework and social work. I was in criminology so and vice versa. So eventually they found that they had to go ahead and get rid of the tests because they were biased by their very nature. And again, it wasn't intentional, but this is one of the reasons why that happened, where there's more men than women in adult and more women than men in juvenile. Two separate departments, by the way, not the same. They didn't all fall under the Department of Corrections. Department of Corrections, and for juveniles, it's called the Department of Services for Children, Youth, and Their Families. Is I think it's just what it's still called anyway. So that the nature of the screening and the testing itself was biased by its nature, not intentional. So they actually got rid of the tests it's based on the job description, and they were able to hire a little bit more diversely. So uh, I think it was my last two years of employment in the state as a training administrator. Someone asked me, why are they so many women in senior leader senior leadership position? I said, well, you could, I know what you're, you could assume one thing. You could assume the negative, but you could also assume the affirmative. And the affirmative in this case is that how many men apply for these jobs versus women? So there's going to be a higher probability that there will be more women than men based on the applicant pool alone. It's just a matter of probability. So that was another thing. Well, why aren't more men applying for these jobs? Why aren't more women applying for other jobs? I don't know. It could be a sociological implication. I'm not a sociologist. Um, at another university where I taught, there was a sociologist who said the same thing I did could be a sociological implication. So it's nice to be in the good graces of the sociologists, you know, um, in that regard anyway, as far as, you know, agreeing. But that's what I see. Um, it's just the way, nature of the beast. But the idea is to protect your organization. You need to make sure that you're recruiting fairly and diversely. And if you do that, then you're including 
you know, as they say, the term inclusion, you're providing the equal opportunity. So, and you're following it under the law. So uh, the next one, employment discrimination. Well, we talked a lot about this in HR, if you take my class in human resources, but just in case, um, I'm going to review this with you. There's two types of Title VII law I really want you to remember. The first is unjustified individual disparate treatment. Unjustified individual disparate treatment, you can just call it disparate treatment. I like saying it the fancy way. Um, that's basically the intent to discriminate against a person or persons who are most qualified for that position based on race, gender, sexual orientation, age, disability, etc. Impact, disparate impact is unintentional, but you're still liable. For instance, that story where the Delaware State Police were recruiting diversely enough or throughout the state enough to represent the general population that's called diverse impact. Ignorance or lack of knowing does not make us innocent. It's the same thing as if you're driving on the road here near school and uh, the speed limit's 35 and Cumberland cop pulls you over, you're doing 45. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't know. I thought it was 45. They're gonna, they can still write you the ticket. Or maybe they'll give you a mulligan on it. But other than that, basically, you know, you're still responsible. So that's kind of the idea. We'll talk about that. So let's get on with the assignment. I tied the assignment, the very first assignment, with some trends that are happening in our society right now. And I decided to focus on the concept of quiet quitting and the great resignation, as well as the importance of employee engagement, all three. So it ties really well into the social foundation, as well as the legal foundation. So as far as the social foundation, we have behaviors um, and I, that are happening here in a lot of uh, industries, especially during the pandemic and even post-pandemic, from what I understand. I'd like to see how things are in the next couple of years. I'm just curious. But uh, I would say they, they and they in the world like to come up with all kinds of buzz phrases. It's dramatic, quiet quitting, the great resignation. That's how they get your attention. You know, everybody puts a label on something or comes up with new terms to kind of say the same thing, which to me means, you know, all right, to employee turnover is what I would call it. And individuals, as far as quiet quitting, doing the bare minimum just to get by. Um, so I don't want you to get confused with quiet quitting, meaning that someone's not doing what they're supposed to do. Why quitting in many, many respects means to simply do exactly what you need to do and no more and move on with your day. Uh, it's what they used to say in state government, do your eight and skate. Basically, spin tires on pavement, it's 4.30, we're out of here. And there's reasons why that happens, especially if you go above and beyond. Well, state budgets aren't real robust, and at least in my 25 years, they hadn't been. Um, in Delaware, and uh, everyone gets the same raise. The cost of living is 2%. And maybe the cost of living each year goes up 3%. So you're actually taking a 1% pay cut based on the value of the dollar, right? So, I mean, there's individuals who are intrinsically motivated to go above and beyond because they want to, they care about what they're doing. They want to get a promotion. They want to be at their best. I'm not saying everyone's like that, but there's a certain reference to that, but that can happen in any organization for for a variety of reasons, including the work environment, um, especially if you have a lousy manager, someone that just motivates by negative reinforcement all the time. I tell you right now, I've been micromanaged before, and I did the absolute bare minimum. There was no reward in doing anything else. It would be all trouble. So whatever I needed to do to avoid any problems, to get out the door and on time, I'm doing it. And no, I will not check my email after work. No, I will not answer phones after work. I will do nothing but. Um, but in a more inspired workforce, I'm willing to go above and beyond. If I'm part of a strategic goal to help to uh, for the organization to be better and for me to be better, yeah, I'm on board with that. I'm here. No problem. So um, employee engagement is very important. My biggest advice 
and this is more of the qualitative aspects of uh, being a leader is to make sure that you have your eyes and ears on the front line. And what I mean by that is you, you talk to them, you ask them about their concerns, you ask them what they do well, you compliment them when they do something really well. They need to hear that. And quite frankly, as a leader, we need to appreciate those who are here to support our goals and who go above and beyond. And if you do that, you'll see others follow suit. And I've seen that personally. It's just little things you don't think of that make a big difference in people's lives. Um, like uh, what I used to do when I worked at this hospital is I'd walk around as a training administrator. At first, they looked at me like I was the white shirt, as they call them. You know, it was looking for problems. And I'm really not looking for problems. I just want to say hello. And after a while, they would talk with me. We had some rapport. Um, yeah, I could tell some amazing things that they do in the laundry. These gigantic laundry machines are huge. They're beautiful. They're from the 60s. And they'll outlast us all. These machines will outlast thermonuclear war. Whereas our modern phones these days die in a couple of years. Um, this is amazing. Uh, I know this one individual in housekeeping, he cleaned up the conference room so nice, mopped it, smelled great, had the windows open. And I just told him once, I said, this is the best I've ever, ever seen it in all my years here. Thank you so much. And he was very attentive to that room when it needed to be cleaned from there in. So it's the little things that make a big difference and can help with issues re regarding quiet quitting. Now, the great resignation, well... People have choices. It's easy to see that individuals have choices. And I'd rather someone move on than be stagnant and not happy with the work that they do. But at the same time, if you see a higher turnover rate, you have to look into the why. And we talked a little bit about this in week one, and I think it gave some examples of lousy leadership, pay could be an issue, hours, lack of flexibility, life changes. There's all kinds of reasons why individuals leave job. But largely, if you look at uh, a position, it's economics. It's all economics. So the value of a position is based on supply and demand as much as it is knowledge, skills, and abilities to do the job. So think about it like this, all right? If, uh, say, in nursing, they can't hire nurses, salary is going to go up. Um, if there's plenty of individuals that want to work in a certain job, the salary is going to remain stagnant, about the same. And that just depends, too, on what kind of talent you're looking for. There are certain jobs that lend more towards salary opportunities than others, say like in engineering or IT, where very few actually know how to do that work. That's possible. Or maybe a job that's really, really dangerous, like ice trucker, or, uh, I don't know, working in a prison, which is uh, pretty daunting to your psyche, uh, to say the very least. So if they can't get corrections officers, which I did provide an example last week about that, about the $5,000 signing bo bonus and all that um, to attract workers. Well, that's how they do it. Even in the state of Pennsylvania, certain jobs where the governor, I guess it's the governor. Well, I'm sure the governor has to give the okie doke on it anyway. Um, certain jobs that require degrees no longer require degrees. And that's because they can't fill the position. So, and I do believe, I think they're phasing it in two, three years, the 20% raise for all employees. Now, it's pretty good, but they're still catching up from cost of living adjustments that were lower than the cost of living uh, over the years, but still better, <laughs> a lot better. And they have great benefits. So it kind of works out, in my opinion. So might not be a bad idea to jump into state employment now. I mean, who knows? Uh, so anyway, moving forward. The idea here is you're a leader and you have to resolve problems in an organization relating to employees doing the minimum. They're not motivated. And you don't have to use quiet quitting. There's motivation issues. There's a very high turnover rate. You don't have to say great resignation. And um, there's a difference, as your text talks about, the economic exchange versus the social exchange. So economics, in this case, has to do a transaction. I work for you. Here's your 75 widgets. I'm leaving. 
a social exchange is much deeper. It's like I feel connected with the work that I do. That's employee engagement. So you can call it economics in the sense of what they would say in leadership, a transactional relationship. Social exchange in this case can also be referenced to as, in, you know, high, high social exchange means that employees are engaged. The simple way you need to, you know, that you can reference to it like that. You don't have to look at a giant flow chart or anything. That's all it really means. So you're going to write a couple pages uh, here, a research paper just as problems for quiet quitting and the great resignation. So basically what you want to do is provide a description of some of the challenges, cite your stuff in APA format, have questions, come talk to me, okay? And the great resignation, then you're tasked with making recommendations. You are the leader or the consultant in this case. Uh, making recommendations about how organizations can address these problems as the means to create a social exchange, we can call it engagement, rather than that economic exchange, which is transactional. So oh, it's due at January 21st at 11.59 p.m. I suggest not waiting till the last moment. I'd rather you call me with questions or contact me with questions early than try to get me at 10 o'clock at night on Sunday, please don't do that because I will be asleep. But uh, the idea here is that I want you to really feel this because you're going to be dealing with this out in the workforce. If you haven't already, for those of you who are um, finishing your degree off here with us and working full time. So, uh, again, I'm open for any questions you have. This lecture went a, bit, a little bit longer, but it had a lot, detail, a lot of details I want to cover there. So thank you very much. And I'll see you on the boards.